evening. We are so glad you are here. Let's stand to our feet as we begin Worthy of Worship.
got to ask, how do you know when to stop? <laughs> I don't know when to stop. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, I just, I just. <laughs> there may only be 26 of us here, but y'all sound good. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. You're going to get your exercise tonight, aren't you? <laughs> Been there, done that. I'm sorry I couldn't have been with you this morning. But I heard the report from Paul Street the four salvation. Amen. You're excited about that, right? Yes. Why? Amen. Why are we excited? That's four more souls for the kingdom of God. Exactly. But that's a choice that we make, right? It's a choice to be excited or not. I mean, realistically speaking, we could be like, yeah, yeah so. Four people got saved. What's the big deal? But that's not what we do. We make the choice to rejoice in that because it's more people for the kingdom. Tonight, I want us to continue with the thought of choose, but move it more from choose to chosen, as God calls us. First Peter chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 4 through 10 this evening. And it says, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stone, being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Bow with me. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the praise report that we experienced this morning in regards to the poor coming to know you through the greatest camp that we have called Paul Street. God, tonight, would you help us and teach us by your Spirit that not only do we get to choose you, but you have chosen us before the foundation of the world. Go with us now. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as our students learn all this week, being isolated from the world, we have choices, right? We make a choice every day. You made a choice today whether to come to church or not. You made a choice what you're going to wear today. Some of you get more freedom in that choice than others, like myself. I'm married and I have to okay absolutely everything I wear with my wife. Because apparently, I don't know what matches and what does not. And I have learned over almost nine years of marriage, if she looks at me and says, are you wearing that? That is a nice way of saying, go change and try again. Still yet, that is a choice that we make. My question is, do we understand, do our students understand, do the ones coming after us understand the most important choice you'll ever make? And that's not about what clothes you're going to wear or what food you're going to eat later tonight, what you're going to order on your pizza, whether pineapple goes on pizza. None of that matters. The choice that you need to make, the most important choice you'll ever make is 
Where are you going to spend eternity? You see, whether Jesus comes back or whether we go to the grave, one day we're all changing addresses. Every one of you in here will change your address. You've got two options when it comes to the realm of eternity. Heaven or hell. If you want to go to heaven, that's a choice you have to make. If you want to go to hell, do absolutely nothing because you're already headed there and that's biblical. I don't mean to be, you know, the bad guy and step on everybody's toes. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I also have a calling from God to preach the full counsel of His Word. My question, and we're going to come back and wrap up with this question as well, is are we choosing Christ? Are we choosing the salvation? Look with me back at verses 4 and 5. And we're going to spend a little bit of time going through this and really breaking this down because there are a lot to unpack in this passage. Coming to Him as a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. We're talking about Jesus in that verse. If you didn't know, we're talking about Jesus. Coming to Him. Who's the Him in that verse? God the Father. Jesus in man form, coming to God the Father as the living stone, rejected by men. We know that, don't we? When Jesus was on earth, he came to who first? The Jews. He came to his people first. Did they accept him? No. That's why you and I as Gentiles are able to have salvation. So easily available. Because the Bible says he came to his own and his own received him not. Then in verse 5 it says, You also as living stones. That's you, that's me, that, that's us. This verse is us, right? We are living stone. How is that possible? Because of Christ. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in his letter? For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Try to wrap your head around that verse. You want to get some strange looks? Go to Walmart and somebody looks at you funny and go, Hey, wait a minute. Look, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives within me. Exactly. You'll get those kind of looks. If you think about it, you are referred to as a living stone because of who your identity is in Christ. Now understand, here's where I'm going to be the toe stomper and the bearer of bad news. There's nothing special about you. Nothing special about me. Even though I'm up on the stage, behind the pulpit, big deal. There's nothing special about me other than the fact that I am saved by the grace of God and called for this purpose just like you if you've accepted Christ. And then it goes on to say, as you, also living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you have that spiritual house to look forward to? Not only that, but you are a spiritual house here and now for the Holy Spirit. The Bible refers to us as a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know why there's not a need for the third temple? Because I'm looking at it. Think about it. There were two temples built in the Old Testament times, right? The last one destroyed in 70 AD. There's no longer a need for a temple because what happened at the temple? Sacrifice. You can go kill any animal you want to and sprinkle the blood all over any fire you want to and it's not going to get you any more saved than a man on the moon. But your body, your soul, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's where He dwells, right? And then it goes on to say a holy priesthood. We're really going to unpack that as we get further down into uh, the verses. <laughs> to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Why would it say that? What kind of spiritual sacrifices could we offer? just sang about one. The very last song. Worship. The first song that we sang, worthy of worship, is acknowledgement 
of how truly worthy the creator of this universe is. And then the last song we sang, Here I Am the Worship, is saying, I understand that, so I'm going to do just that. That's the best sacrifice you can give God. I'm going to tell off on myself in relation to this. As a kid, y'all go with me here, kid, okay? I told you I'm going to tell off on myself, so we got to get this right, kid. I used to cry around Christmas time when I heard a very specific song. The little drummer boy. I did. It's not that funny. The part that says, I am a poor boy too, for up of a mom. I have no gift to bring that's fit to give our king. Made me ball like a baby. I'm not talking just a scream here, screaming. No, ugly cry. Ugly cry. Turn it off. Change it. Get rid of that song. I don't want to hear it. I saw me in there, being this poor boy in comparison to the God of the universe. And what do I have to give him that's even remotely acceptable? Not a thing. Look, the hardest pill I learned to swallow was the time I went to Great Britain on a, on a mission trip, and they told us, look, you have absolutely nothing to bring to the table except sin. Think about that. You and I, on our own accord, have nothing to bring to the table that's going to amount, amount to anything eternally other than your sin. But the God of this universe said it doesn't matter. I want Him. I want Her. Look with me in verse 6. This is where we really start unpacking things because of how in-depth it goes. Verse 6, remember this is the Apostle Peter talking. He said, therefore it is also contained in Scripture. How many of you know that when Peter said that, he's not referencing the New Testament Scripture? You know why he's not referencing it? Still in the process of being written as Peter speaks. So he's referencing the Old Testament. In fact, this very verse as it goes on, uh, Behold, I lay and die on a chief cornerstone, the lake precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. That is Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, word for word. So let's look at it. It says, Behold, I lay in Zion. That word Zion there is another name for the nation of Israel. Israel, when talked about in the Bible, is often referred to as salvation. So you can intertwine or interchange those words if you want. So behold, I lay in the salvation a chief cornerstone. Well, Okay, who or what is that cornerstone? Jesus. That's an easy church answer. Everybody likes to say that. <laughs> Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Elect, precious. God elected Jesus in his man form, right? It's not that there wasn't ever Jesus. We can get into that and we can spend all night and even into, into tomorrow talking about the Trinity. We just don't have that kind of time. But then in man form, God elected him before the foundation of the world to be the sacrifice that you and I required. And that is a precious thing. And anyone who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Didn't Jesus say the very same thing in his ministry? If you will accept me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. Drives me crazy when I get those chain emails that had that verse at the bottom of it. Being in the school system, I'm sure you know, I'm sure you've gotten those. You know what I do as soon as I get them? Delete. Some of you look at me crazy. Why? Because you're taking that verse out of context. 
Just because I forward that email to 10 people doesn't mean I'm acknowledging God. How about when I go to Walmart there's only one checkout line? Am I going to get frustrated, just throw the cart and leave everything there? Or am I going to give the, the cashier the grace and mercy that God shows me? Maybe even encourage them as I go through their life. Hey, you know what? You're doing a good job. Forget what everybody else has said. I understand it's busy. You're up here by yourself. It's a choice that we make. Then we go on into verse 7. It says, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That part there, the stone which the builder rejected, dot, dot, dot. That is Psalm 118 and verse number 22. Again, quoting from the Old Testament. The terminology there that he uses in regard to the chief cornerstone and the stone which the builder rejected, that is a term that is important to anybody that is building a house or a structure or anything of that sort. Think about it. Go with me here. Let's play make-believe. My five-year-old loves this game. We are going to demolish this sanctuary. We're going to rebuild something we can rebuild the same thing. We can rebuild whatever you're envisioning in your mind of the new sanctuary. However you want to look at it, it doesn't matter. We've got the foundation poured. It's the first thing we've got to put down. We've got to put that stone, that cornerstone. The chief cornerstone is the very first one you put down. Whatever corner you want to go to, doesn't matter, you've got four options, pick one. When you place that stone down, get everything just right, get it level and say, we're good from there. At the chief cornerstone, you just set the groundwork for the rest of the three. So Jesus being the chief cornerstone, it's a solid foundation that you need to continue building. Then it says that he is the stone in which the builder rejected. Each and every one of us are building something. In regards to eternity, you're building the kingdom of God as a believer in Jesus when you witness, whether it be by your words or by your life. I've heard it said, and I truly believe, that sometimes your life is the only Bible people will ever read. Think about that for a minute. What you do outside of these walls sometimes is the only witness the lost world is ever going to receive. Aside from the general revelation of Jesus, right? <coughs> Jesus being the stone that the builder rejected, that's them saying, no, I don't need that. I can build my eternal, whatever word you want to use there, how, whatever, without that Jesus. Folks, i got news for you. There's a lot of people, so-called churches, that will stand up and say, Jesus isn't the only way. You can believe whatever you want to, and it'll be all right. Well, they're wrong. One day, unfortunately, they'll find out. What's the Bible say? Jesus, specifically, in his teaching, he said, you build your house upon the sand, when the rains and the storms come, what happens? I'll fall. But if you build it upon the stone, it will withstand, right? I remember being in this church, again, little kid, in children's church, maybe even Bible school, and learning that song. My favorite part talking about the house on the sand, and the house on the sand went flat. I couldn't wait for that split. It has nothing to do with the message, really. But I just did that in there. 
Jesus as the chief cornerstone, if we apply that to our lives, if we make him our chief cornerstone, that as we continue to build the kingdom for Christ, mind you, you're not building it for you, you're building it for him, for his glory. If he's the chief cornerstone, that very first one that you lay, the rest of everything will fall into place where it's supposed to. Think about it. Go back to that analogy with me of rebuilding this sanctuary. Put that foundation out there, and I walk and I place a stone right in the middle of it. I say, all right. Now put the walls on the outside. How's that going to work for you? Yeah, even Miss Willow said, it's, it's not going to work. You can't do it. Now my question is, why do we try so hard? To do just that. Why do we try so hard? God calls us on a daily basis to make a choice, right? Live for me, don't live for me. Whether you're a Christian or not, it's irrelevant at this point. He says, do this or don't do this. That's a choice you've got to make. Why so much of the time instead of following along the path that the chief cornerstone put and going in that straight line to build the wall, so to speak, why do we want to take that stone and put it right in the smack dab middle and say, all right, I did my part. I put the wall. Knowing good and well, that wall would just fall right back down and crumble. Now, not only are you in a mess, but it's going to take longer to build what you're trying to accomplish. Going down to verse 8 with me. He goes to another Old Testament verse, so he ties it in by using that one word we love in the English language, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. That those two sentences there, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, comes out of Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 14. He goes back and quotes from the prophet Isaiah. Now that's not word for word. He took a little piece out of it. But it fits the narrative. It fits the thought. It's a complete thought at that. So what in the world are we talking about there when he says a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? If many of you have come up with me over the years, because I know most all of you, if not all of you, knew me as child. I grew up here. I can point out the section in which me and my family sit. If you kept up with me, you know that I didn't learn to walk really well. I have broken my left foot three times and my right foot three times. My left thumb, I can't even tell my left and my right. My left thumb and my right thumb, both of them. Broke them and dislocated them. In fact, today, after church time, I was at the house. Smoke detector started chirping. Everybody knows what that means. Change the battery. So I did. The question is, how did I do it? Smoke detector is in my bedroom. I've got a dresser that comes up about gate high. And it's about gate far from the wall which the smoke detector is on. Did I go get a step ladder? And climb up there? No. I hopped up on the dresser, stood up. You're laughing as if you know the conclusion of this story. That's when I got down. Yes, as I went to get down, I thought, okay, best, easiest way, crouch down, almost sit down on the dresser, put my feet on, walk right off. As I went to crouch down, that dresser tumbled. And somehow, as the dresser went this way, I went this way. Uh, you can see it, I'm all bruised up on my arm. That's the only thing that has resulted of it, thank God. I'm graceful when it comes to standing upright. If I could lay down all the time, it would be much better, and I wouldn't have near the doctor bills that I've had. That stone of stumbling that we're talking about, I get that. I can relate to that. We as Christians, and I use that in quotation because everybody nowadays calls themselves a Christian. We are to be a stumbling block to the non-believer. Think about it. 
I told you the story about me being real graceful at walking. Because if we're building this new sanctuary that I used as an analogy, and you put that, that cornerstone out there, in the corner, mind you, get it all nice and neat, and I come walking by, not paying attention. I hit that stone. Hey, it's going to hurt. It? Everybody know that? That's going to hurt. You're going to know you should have been paying attention real soon. But what happened? I stumbled. Right? Maybe I fell. We as believers should do that to the non believers They ought to know they can't act the way they're acting. They can't do the things they're doing around us. I don't tell you this story to pat myself on the back, toot my own horn, or increase my ego. Because I can do that on my own by looking in a mirror. I don't need anybody's help increasing my ego. That's, that's part of my sinful nature. As a student in high school, the tardy bell rang in school. Teachers still decided I'm not going to come into class yet. I'm sitting in there on my, my own business. Believe it or not, I was a good kid. I was. You don't got to look away and act like you don't hear me. I'm sitting there minding my own business. One, I don't want to get in trouble. Two, my mama works at the school, so I really don't want to get in trouble. Some kids over from me decide they're going to do the smartest thing ever and bring out a Ouija board and start playing with it before class would start. And finally, one of them got smart and said, wait a minute. Ethan sitting over there. We can't do that here. Not, not here, not now. I looked over at him because I heard my name. That's what got my attention. I said, wait, what are we talking about? He said, well, we were, we were going to bring out a Ouija board and these voodoo cards and all this other nonsense and start playing with them. I don't know if that's the proper term to use either. And I said, yeah, we're not going to said, I've got a better idea. Why don't we pull our Bibles out and see what happened? Well, they didn't like that either, but I still got mine out. You see, things ought to change because people know who we are. And I don't mean they know what your name is or they can describe you when you're not there. That's not what I mean. I mean they know who we are in Christ. And then it says we're to be a rock of offense. Now look, this does not mean I'm giving you permission to go out and offend absolutely everybody. Because A, I don't have that authority, and B, that's not what Scripture says. But when it comes to informing somebody that what they're doing is something the Bible calls sin, don't be afraid to do it, even if it offends them. And in today's society, you can offend somebody by blinking the wrong way. I'm just being realistic. They don't like the color shirt that you have on. You just offended somebody. Nowadays, we really don't worry about whether we offend somebody or not, do we? We just do what we have to do, and if it offends you, there's the door. You, you know how to get in. You know how to get out. Why don't we take that same mentality when it comes to our spiritual life? Why don't even in the schoolhouse we say, look, we're going to pray. If you want to pray, great, join us. If you don't, fine. Granted, I know why we don't do that. There's, there's laws and legalities there. That would be a question for our students, though. Why don't you do it? Did you see? I was that kid in school where a teacher couldn't. I can I can't disrupt class to do it, but I can do it before class, after class, in between class, before the tardy bell rings. Why not? You can go look at any private Christian school you want to. That's great. You can wish you could have that. You know what? Realistically, our students could. If they would do it. What about in the grown-up world. What about in the workplace? Why don't our co-workers 
act differently because of us. Again, I understand there's laws in place and everybody says there's three things you don't talk about and that's religion, politics, and music. What? I don't really care. If we want to talk about it, let's talk about it. You're not going to offend me. I may offend you. I'm not trying to, but I might. I'm just very founded in the Word. I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. And if you give me about 10 minutes to 2 hours, I'll tell you. But verse 8 makes it clear that they stumble being disobedient to the Word. You can tell them the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. The Bible says but in verse 8, that latter part there, they said they're being disobedient to the Word, so they don't really care what the Bible says. If you need an example of that, look out any window. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Look around. Being disobedient to the Word. Now going to verse 9. This is where we really dig into the word chosen, verses 2. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The first part there, a chosen generation. Kind of makes you feel good, don't it? That's that little ego boost we all like. What makes us a chosen generation? Because God knew when you were going to be born. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what the date or your, or your, your year is that you were born in. I'll tell you mine. Contrary to popular belief, I'm only almost 30 years old. I was born in 1992. I was a chosen generation. You're a chosen generation. As a generation as a whole, from the time Jesus got up and walked out of that grave to present day, that is a chosen generation. Chosen by God to be able to receive this thing called salvation. You see, prior to Jesus walking out of the tomb, salvation wasn't obtainable by just accepting a free gift. Uh-uh. You had to go to the temple. You had to present your sacrifice to the priest, let the priest take it, look at it, examine it, make sure it meets the qualification, and then do the act of the sacrifice. Praise God we don't have to do that today. I couldn't do it. Because you see, part of the sacrifices were grain offerings, things of that nature. That means you had to grow vegetation. I look at plant the wrong way. They die. I don't have a green thumb. I admire those of you that do. I can't do it. I've tried. Raising livestock. I don't want to wake up any earlier than I absolutely have to. I've got to get up on an average at 4.30 in the morning to be at work. And that's getting also my kids up, taking them to the babysitter, so on and so forth. So if I'm raising livestock and things of that nature on top of that, because I have to in order to be in a right standing with God, not only do I have to wake up at what I do now, 4.30, I've got to get up earlier than that to go feed the livestock, go feed the sheep, go feed the goats, go feed the cow. I don't think so. I tell people all the time, I look the way I do because I don't get beauty sleep. Then it says, the next thing it calls us is a royal priesthood. Now mind you, this is not talking about anything related British. In today's world, when we hear the word royal, we automatically think Great Britain. The royal family. Right? No, this is beyond that. My question is, before we get into the royal side of things, when you hear the word priest or priesthood, what's the first thought that comes to your head? Come on, we can be interactive. It's okay. What do you think of when you hear the word priest? What's that? Captain. Okay. We can take that. 
I, I was waiting for, for some of those answers, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, some of the others, uh, Lithuanian, I believe, used the term priest. Nonetheless, do we know what the purpose of a priest is? A priest is somebody that will act as a mediator between God and man. In fact, in the Catholic denomination, religion, whatever term you want to use there, the priest, you go to the, him uh, in confession, and you say, forgive me for I've done, and you start naming off your sin. And then the priest will tell you in return, if you will do X, Y, and Z, then you will receive forgiveness for A, B, and C. I got news for you, that's not how the Bible says it works. Praise God. But it still gives a good representation of that mediator. But God called us here as a royal priesthood. We are to be that mediator between God and man when it comes to the lost world. I love how you guys do the corporate prayer time here. My question is, how often do we earnestly pray for the lost that aren't here? Every one of you, if I were to ask you to name somebody who you know is lost, could probably give me a name. I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd put a paycheck on it. Everybody knows somebody that's lost. Now how often do we pray for them? How often do, as the Bible say, we make intercession for them? Beg God. Keep working on their life. I'll admit, I'm guilty of it. I don't do it near like I'm called to. Then it goes on and he said, you are a holy nation. This is where I get excited. If you ask me what my nationality is, what do you expect me to say? Okay, if I ask you what your nationality is, what do you say? What's that? America. America. Sure. I got one better for you. I'm heavenly. You see, when God called me out of darkness into his marvelous light, as it says at the ending of verse 9, he changed my nationality. In fact, he changed it so much, I went from death to life, as it says in another part of the Bible. That's why when it came to Bible school, and yes, I went to about every one in the county, at least in the Southern Baptist denomination. I went to a couple outside, but they confused me because I memorized every song and every hand motion to the one in the Baptist, and it threw me off going somewhere else. But I would always volunteer to be one of the flag bearers. There's two flags and then the Bible. I never could determine which one I wanted to carry. I loved them all. I love the fact that the Bible represents the living Word of God. I want to be a part of it. I want to carry it. I love that flag, red, white, and blue. I love my country. I want to carry it. I want to show my support. I love that flag, representing what God did for me. And I love the fact that it's 90% white, re resembling my surrenderance to Him. I can't make up my mind which one I want to carry. But above all else, before I'm that American, I'm his. Then he calls us his own special people. Listen to me, please. Just a few more minutes, I promise. I know we've spent a lot of time going through this, but I want you to hear this part, because this was the hardest pill I ever had to swallow. His own special people, do we understand that God does not need us? No, really. Do we understand that God doesn't need you? God doesn't need me. You see, the difference is between need, God wants you. God wants me. I talked to my wife. Unfortunately, she's not here. But I told a couple of you I have a teething five-month-old. Very, very fuzzy. You would probably hear him a hundred times more than you would hear me if he were here tonight. And he slobbers worse than any breed of dog you could ever imagine right now. 100% true. 
but I talked to her. She, she went to doctor. Horrible situation. To the point that as a little girl between the ages of three and five, one would walk. Her parents withheld water from her. I said, so what would you do to get a drink? She said, I would beg them to use the bathroom. I said, oh, so you could go in the bathroom, turn the sink on, cup your hand, get you a drink. She said, I tried that one time. I said, what do you mean one time? What, what? She said, I tried it one time and my stepmom came in and tried to drown me to teach me a lesson never to turn the water on again. She was getting heated and aggravated and mad at these thought. And I said, okay, but what did you do to get water? She said, with tears rolling down her, her face, ugly cry, recalling these memories. I'm an outsider looking in. I, I love her to death. I had a great childhood. I couldn't have asked for a better one. But I asked her, I said, what did you do to get water? She said, I would walk over to the toilet, scratching my head. She said, I would dip down. I said, uh -huh. She said, I would take a little scoop out of the toilet. Hopefully not enough to notice there's water missing from it. And I would drink it. My heart fell straight to my stomach. She said, I have never felt more unwanted than in that moment. Now, praise God, her grandmother adopted her. And when her grandmother adopted her, at six years of age, she weighed 40 pounds. You can count every bone in her body. I've seen the pictures. For the first couple of months, she would walk through. Tim and his all get up. Can I have a drink of water? Can I have a piece of bread? Can I have this? Can I have that? She would hide food amongst the house. That way she could sneak through at night and get it. And finally broke through to her. You can have whatever you want when you want. She did nothing but eat for several weeks. Non-stop. Now, praise God, I love the woman to death and she can cook. I got to get it. You can tell I don't miss a minute. I make sure of it. She went from unwanted to wanted. A, her family wants her. More importantly, I let her know all the time I want her. How much more does God want you? Think about it. For those of you married in here, how much did you, each other want you? My wife pointed out the fact to me that I could no longer survive after almost nine years of marriage. I could not survive on my own. I was unaware of that. She pointed it out to me, and I'm grateful for it. It's nice to feel one, isn't it? The slogan of this church, or the tagline, the catchphrase, whatever you want to call it, is where God's love comes first. And I've said this before from behind this pulpit. When somebody new walks through that door, do they understand that? Do they realize that? They ought to. You ought to make them feel one. Chosen. Glad that they're here. Let's look at verse 10 as we come to a close. Verse 10 says, Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. Do we truly understand what the word mercy means? Boy, I thought I did. I looked it up, and it, the word mercy means compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is with one's power to punish or harm. Again, I'm going to tell you a story, and it's not to pat myself on the back. But in trying to teach my son what God does for us so that sooner rather than later he can come to the saving faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life, he had been aggravated for a while. No, that's hard to believe. But he, he was. And he finally did just the, the last thing that just broke it off. He now deserves a spank. But it wasn't quite so bad that I'm going to do it right in right there. I told him, I looked at him, and I don't hardly ever do this, but I told him, you go to your room and you wait. I'll be in there in a second. Well, that kind of put the fear of God in there. 
He does it. He doesn't want to, but he does it. And I walk in there, and I don't use a belt when I punish my kids. They're not old enough for it yet, one. He's five years old. But this time, I have the belt in my hand. I looked at him and I said, you know what's coming, don't you? He's not crying because he's sorry. He's crying because he don't want to spank me. I said, what did you do, boy? And he told me, that proves to me he understands what he did to get in trouble. And I said, now, because you did that, what should happen? I get a spanking. That's right. Turn around. And I, I went old old school, where we used to give kids swats in school, make them stand there with their hands on the desk, make him put his hands on his bed. I said, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to give you your swat. Okay. One. Watch. Two. I flexed his bed as big as I could on my arm. Had the belt in my right arm, just because I'm right handed. And I said, three. I slapped that belt across my arm. Let it wrap around. I pulled the belt away. I said, stand up. I relaxed. Instantly, there's a bruise on my arm. I showed him my arm. I said, touch it. He touched it. I said, that hurts. I said, do you understand what I did there? Uh -oh. At this point, he's now crying because he thinks dad is hurt. He understands that what he did that deserved to spank it hurt death. God showed us mercy. How much do we hurt death? Through all of this, Peter is reminding us here that at one point in our lives, we were lost without salvation that God gives us. But now, for those of us who have called upon the name of the Lord, we're saved. I get in theological discussions with people all the time about can you lose your salvation? Let me break it down for you. Can you earn it? Come on, you're Southern Baptist. That should be the biggest head shake ever. Can you earn it? No. If you can't earn it, you can't lose it. Now, if you want to go into detail and biblical theological detail, get with me later because time's almost up and you're going to cut my microphone off according to David Griffin. So when he talks about you have not obtained mercy, but you have now obtained mercy, let me, let me break this down for you. Every one of us, lost or saved, have obtained mercy. That's not what Peter's saying. Remember that choice we made? That choice, we're given mercy on a daily basis. It's up to us whether we accept the mercy, talking about salvation, or not. The Bible says that it rained on the just and the unjust. That's God's grace. That's God's mercy. I can think about my life in the almost 30 years of my existence. And I'm pretty sure all the way back at about four years of age, because of that one stupid word I smarted off to my mama, I should have been dropped dead. I sinned, and I knew I sinned. And then there was the next day. And the next day, and the next day, and today. I'll admit it, I lost my temper today with my son. We're still in the process. We moved in, we're right there. I no longer drive to church, I walk out and across my yard. And we're, we're moving stuff and getting stuff organized, and okay, we have this picture, where are we gonna put it? Especially after I fell when changing the, the batteries in the smoke detector, everybody except for my five-month-old, that just because he can't, came running. Well, my wife stood at the door while my son wanted to be right there. What happened, Dad? Get back. My dad, my dad, my dad, get back. I lost my cool. I see that as a sin. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but it is to me. So the Bible says in those gray areas, if you call it a sin, it's a sin. I have to repent of that. I lost my cool. He didn't deserve that. I gave it to him, but he didn't deserve it.
All of those times I told you I should have been struck dead. God didn't kill me, take me out. That's his mercy on our life. Now that we are saved and we have chosen, excuse me, to obtain that mercy of salvation, we ask for it every second of every day, don't we? Tomorrow's Monday. You know what my prayers are for Monday? God, it's a Monday. You made it. I'm glad you made it. But it's a Monday and something stupid's going to happen to me. And I'm going to retort with something even more stupid. God, bring it to my attention immediately so that I may repent of it and stop doing it. Y'all be honest with you, I have a very low tolerance for stupidity. Somebody cuts me off in traffic tomorrow. They may not know it, but I'm going to let them know it. They may not hear a word that comes out of my mouth, but I'm going to let them know about it. Does it do any good? No. Do I have to repent for it later? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. My question is, the four main things that we see here, understanding who Jesus is for us. That's what Peter wants you to understand in this passage. Who Jesus is for you. Understanding, and I put this as nicely as I can, how dumb we as people are in regard to rejecting the gift of salvation that Jesus gives us. Understanding that Jesus or God, either, either one, you can interchange those words there, doesn't need us, but he wants us. So much so that as the Bible says, he'll leave the 99 to go after the one. And understanding our call to follow him after we accept salvation. Have you made that decision? Have you gone from choose where God chooses you and then you choose to follow him to now being called chosen? <laughs> every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. It's almost 5.30 and I promise I'll have you out of here by 5.30. If you've made the choice to accept Jesus, praise God. If not, I cannot justify meaning opening the Word of God, letting the Holy Spirit move, and not giving you a chance to respond if that's what you need to do. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I don't know if I know this Jesus. I thought I, I, I thought I'd made that choice, but I really just don't know. Why gamble on eternity? If you cannot say for 100% certain, I know that I know Jesus, and I know that if I were to leave this world right now, I'm going to be with Him. If you can't say that, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. In fact, I'll turn the microphone off and set it aside. But I do want to talk to you, and I want to pray with you. We saw four today, or heard a report of four today that gave their heart to Jesus. Is there number five here tonight? If there is, would you just kindly look up at me?